get on tape? Um, I think there's a common thread. You know, a lot of people talk about, well, here. The, um, at the LBJ Library, there is an exhibit that says a thousand laws passed in the Great Society are words along those lines. And then, very poignantly, there is a bust uh, uh, reflecting a person who um, was affected by those laws. Uh, whether they be laws of civil rights or education or, or the environment or uh, health care or any of the major areas that Daddy worked so very hard to address the public need. And I've often thought when I go through that exhibit how to Lyndon Johnson those thousand bills meant nothing unless you could see it in the eyes of a human being and how lives were changed. And that was what he was all about, was how can I make lives better for my fellow human beings, my fellow Americans, yes, but my, I mean, Lyndon Johnson was, he was very much an American. He was very much a Texan. He was very much a Democrat. He was very much all of the above. But if you go to see one of his favorite qu quotes, the thing that is at the top of the list is I'm a free man. And that's what he wanted for everybody else. And so all the efforts were to how do I provide freedom, help provide freedom and opportunity that I've enjoyed and get it out there to those, to those other folks. And he loved for Linda and me, but not just for Linda and me, Bob, for you and Harry, for everybody who was on his staff. I mean, he was always, always, always teaching and always teaching by parable or story, call it what you will. But the reason why he did that is he wanted to put it in the, in the framework of folks that you could understand. Now I'll tell you, I have absolutely no doubt that the Quieter Boys did not <laughs> do all the things that Daddy would tell the stories about. I think he sometimes adapted them for convenience. Uh, but the essence of it, was true. In fact, I was talking uh, the other day. We dedicated the Junction School where Lyndon Johnson first went to school. And we had a, um, a wonderful teacher who was a Head Start graduate. And she'd come from an a, a impoverished and abusive family in the mountains of North Carolina and and because of programs of, like Head Start and student loans and and uh, um, federal dollars to the institutions that she went to along the road, the opportunities that she had were beyond dreams that she'd ever thought she could have. The first fact is she said that that um, we all need heroes. And she quoted Lyndon Johnson talking about needing a hero. Everybody does. And Franklin Roosevelt was Lyndon Johnson's hero. Well, Lyndon Johnson, for me, and I think for all of our extended family, you included, he, he was your hero. And, and, and he, he, he told you stories to try to teach you a lesson about what she could do to maybe make life better for so, somebody, but he always put it in a, in a context with a name and a face, like this Candace Call that I just met. I'll never forget her name as long as I live. 
because as important as Head Start was and as important as my, I worked with it for 14 years, God knows, you know, all of this legislative agenda that we had, it wasn't something for those other folks. The campaigns weren't just for family. I worked in Head Start for 14 years because I believed in it. And because Daddy made it really clear to me that that was a real important thing for me to do. No, I did it because I believed in it and I loved it. But, um, you know, he was, he was, he, he was my hero, but he provided me somebody to believe in. Um, in Texas right now, and we'll see how the, the race turns out. Uh, but there's a wonderful young African-American man that's running for the Senate. His name is Ron Kirk. And his mother, Willie Mae Kirk, was one of the great community activists in, in, my, in my town from as long as I can remember. And worked with her on so many campaigns. And the idea that uh, this very civic-minded, community-caring family might end up having a son who would, who would occupy the same senatorial seat that Lyndon Johnson had, just, gosh, what a, what a, what a thrilling personal journey for us that would be. Um, Everybody who worked for Lyndon Johnson, and we all worked for him, whether we, were, whether we were members of the family or whether we were paid employees or whether we were non-paid employees. <laughs> um, felt his energy, probably still do feel his energy. Uh, when I get up in the morning, if I've laid in bed a while, I'm, I, I feel, I hear him in the background saying, you know, every other boy in town has a half day ahead of you. Done a half day work by now, Lucy, and you're getting up at eight o'clock. Uh, um, his goals, his dreams, his sense for justice, um, they're never passed because you know the work hadn't been done and you feel that, that that energy, that passion, that what have you done lately to try to advance the agenda of justice? He told us one time, and he said, I never had a job that I thought I was completely up to. That's why I always had to work twice as hard as everybody else around me. Does that make sense to you? Oh, it makes perfect sense to me. Uh, and yes, my father did have a lot of insecurity. Had a lot of insecurity about the, the, he, the humble circumstances of his birth and upbringing in a world where he saw so many people who had so much more advantage. And yet I think in his heart of hearts he thought he was the one who was really the, the, the blessed one because he thought that there were a whole lot more folks like him than there were from these folks that had gone to all these fancy schools and had all these unbelievable initials after their names. And, uh, uh, and I think he was right. You know, he, the story that we all have a jillion versions of about sitting at the Joint Chiefs of Staff with all these graduates from all these fancy schools and one from Southwest Tex Texas State Teachers College. And of course, the one who, who was from Southwest Tex Texas State Teachers College was the guy that was in charge. And uh, that's about the shortest version of that I've ever, <laughs> I've ever told because embellishing it makes so much much fun when you talk about the Harvards and the West Points and the Naval Academies, etc., compared to that little small teacher's college. But he had an education that can't be paid for with dollars and cents. He had a, a, a his, his currency was in, in um, mental and physical toiling with the issues, with the people who faced 
life's inequities. He'd, as he used to say, he'd been there in, in so many ways. And if he hadn't been there, he wanted to go there. He wanted to press the flesh. He wanted to hear from them what their trials and tribulations were. He wanted to be a part of making it better. I mean, I think back, if he were to assess what were the golden moments of a career, um, I think one of the great golden moments for him was uh, the um, work that he did with the uh, uh, Lower Colorado River Authority. The ability to bring electricity. The National uh, Rural Electrification Program. The ability to bring electricity to his, his neighbors. Gosh, something just that basic. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Certainly. <coughs> to be able to bring that, that basic blessing to his friends and neighbors meant, meant the world to him. But yes, he, uh, I think he felt all his life, uh, on one hand, a sense of insecurity because he hadn't had more educational opportunity, more privileged experience, uh, and uh, yet a sense of, um, oh, I don't think smugness was the word, but a sense of valuing the currency of having been there and understanding and appreciating. I mean, he used to talk about his daddy. He could remember his daddy maybe having too much to drink sometime towards the end of the month because he realized he didn't have the money in the bank to pay the house rent. And what was he going to do? What was he going to do? So he was trying to escape in a, in a glass of alcohol because he knew he had a wife and children that were dependent on him. And there are lots of men and women out there who, who feel those kinds of crunches. And um, I think he felt that God had blessed him in helping him to understand those needs because by understanding him, he had a, maybe the ability to address them more effectively. Um, Lyndon Johnson was a man of the land. He, I think, thought that he would be possibly uh, the last rural president. And of course, uh, President Carter came on afterwards and was very much a son of the South and a man of the land. But I think that's one of the reasons why my parents made the decision they did to, to give the LBJ Ranch to the American people. And they did that without any um, approval from Linda or me. Now you might look and say approval from Linda or you. Did you own it? Do you, were you in a position to approve? And the answer is heavens no. But I think if, they, if they'd sought our input, it might have made it very difficult for them and for us. Because it would have been very difficult for us to, to, to give up that part of our heritage that's brought so much comfort. I mean, it's at the LBJ Ranch that, you know, we spent every Christmas, but one that we spent in the White House, two, one in the White House and one at the, at the Governor's Mansion in Virginia when my brother-in-law Chuck was governor. Uh, otherwise, every, every Christmas since I was five years old has been spent at the LBJ Ranch. Uh, it's where I was married. It's where my children were baptized. Um, yeah, so to give it away, would have been very difficult. But, You'll always have it. But, but Daddy, exactly. A, I will always have it in my memory. B, I can go like anybody else and, and, and get on one of those buses and, and go through and you know, point out where my room was and what my history was. But it was the right thing to do. It really should belong to the American people because he belonged 
to the American people. He was so much a part of that. And when I went out on the ranch this weekend with my 89-year-old uh, mother, we went up to the um, what, an area we call the top of the Martin, and uh, it's a place that I know you've been many, many times. Daddy would come racing through the house like a force of nature just before the sunset and say, hurry, hurry, get in the car, get in the car, Lucy Baines, come on, come on, we gotta go see the sunset, we gotta go watch the deer. And I wanted to say, <clears throat> I've seen the sunset. I've watched those deer. They, they're gonna look the same today as they did yesterday and the day before. But not to Lyndon Johnson. Every day there was a sunset meant there was a brand new chance, a brand new page that we were going to start over to make a difference. And he wanted to be out there on the land, cherishing what God had given us and saying, hallelujah, thank you for this great day and by God, I got to go figure out what I'm going to do the next one. Or when times were really tough. He wanted to be out there in that exceptional beauty that only God can give. Trying to soak up that, that comfort, that promise that yes, in the midst of all this pain, there will be another day. There will be maybe some hope that will come with it. And uh, I went up there with my mother and looked around and thought about what it meant to Daddy. And I wanted to say, Daddy, you know, forgive me. I didn't know what this could do for your soul. I didn't appreciate it like I should have. Gosh, I'm so glad I've lived long enough to be able to do that in my mother's presence. My hair is beginning to fall down. Can you see, James, that my hair is falling down in the back? Uh, no, count. Oh, it is. So y'all are going to have to give me a minute. I apologize for this. You're in the life of your children. Um... And of course, in Lyndon's life, uh, larger than life, and, and, and Lyndon feels very much the, um, the mantle of responsibility to reflect well, the personal privilege of having known him, Quite candidly, there are many more pictures, and you know it, of Lyndon Johnson with Lyndon Nugent. And there are pictures of Lyndon Johnson with Lucy Johnson. In spite of the fact that when Lyndon Johnson died, Lucy Johnson was 25 and Lyndon Nugent was six, not quite six. So, uh, but you know, grandfathers, that's the way it is. And firstborn and grandchild and an only male heir that he'd had. I mean, it was, it was a big deal. Uh, Nicole, uh, my eldest daughter, I feel, think feels a real sense of Oh, gosh, I wished I'd been older, but I was there, and I have pictures, and I can see, and I have some memories. Um, Rebecca and Claudia, a mantle of responsibility for them as well, but none of that personal privilege of having known and loved him. I don't want to make reference to their feeling that mental responsibility and Lyndon and, and look like I think that Nicole doesn't feel it because she is uh, a ex very much a community activist and very much involved in the, the social issues of health and, and uh, caring for the poor and education and all of those things that Lyndon Johnson was. So all four of my children are very, uh, feel a very strong sense of moral responsibility to the issues that their grandfather uh, 
worked hard for and uh, respect and appreciation and you know on his side um, some of them are more politically conservative than others uh, but all of them feel uh, a immense uh, respect pride gratitude love Lyndon's never smug about the huh, I you know you don't know I only knew him I think he's he's very genteel about that and I think he feels um, a sense of uh, gosh I wish my sisters could have known him too but um, um, when Lyndon was a little boy we called him Lynn because the idea of calling him the same thing that the only person we knew that really was named Lyndon was daddy it's not like John where there's you know as in President Kennedy where there are a jillion Johns in the world there, there weren't a jillion Lyndons so the name seemed to sort of belong to one <laughs> personality uh, I could no more have called my son Lyndon Lyndon in his grandfather's life I don't think then pigs can fly. But um, after Daddy died, it just somehow seemed right. And uh, my son Lyndon, his first name is Patrick Lyndon. He doesn't use the Patrick at all, doesn't like it when it is used. That's not anything negative about the Patrick at all. It's just a, um, I think he feels a great honor to be named Lyndon and he, wants to bear and reflect well upon that name. But all our children have family names, um, except for Nicole Marie, my eldest daughter. And when she was about, I don't know, five years old, she came to me and she said, I don't understand. Every, everybody in the family, maybe she was six, everybody in the family has a family name except me. Why don't I have a family name? And I looked at her and said, because I made a mistake. You go out there, pick a family name, any name you want, and I'll go down, after a year, I'll go down to the courthouse with you and change it, if that's what you want to do. But I want you to wear that name around for a while to see if you feel comfortable with it. You remember uh, what she chose? Well, for about a year, she called herself Bird. And we, in fact, have some pictures where she's got her name monogrammed on her skirt, and, and she was Bert. Well, you can imagine what a brother two and a half years older might find out that, that rhymed with Bert. And so after about one year of uh, her brother using, you know, bathroom talk, referring to his baby sister, one year bird turd was all she could handle <laughs> and so she never did get that family name but she certainly has lived up to that family name why did you change the spelling of your name <coughs> uh, when you're an adolescent you're trying to figure out who you are and 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 carve your little special place in the sunshine and I had a lot of friends who had names like Elizabeth who could be Elizabeth or Liz or Betty or Beth or, and, and went through those sort of, uh, um, you know, Kate Cronkite's a beautiful example of someone who's done that. She was Kathy for many years and now she's Kate. And I, so I was along those lines. Well, when your name is Lucy, it wasn't Lucinda. Or it wasn't Lucille. I mean, there wasn't a whole lot. My name was just Lucy. And uh, so I changed it from Y to I as my outrageous act of defiance. I mean, today, would I be comfortable going back to Y? Sure. Am I comfortable having it named I? Yes. Would I love for that never to have been made an issue? Absolutely. Who made it an issue? I did. <laughs> so, so I live with the repercussions of it. It's not a big deal at all now. And in fact, I like the name very much. I recognize that I was named for a favorite aunt, and I'm very comfortable in that skin. For a while, I wouldn't. Lucy, let me ask you a question. Politics. How serious do you think your father was about running for president in 1960? Not. I think he loved the Senate. I think there were a lot of people who wanted him to run for the president because they felt that he could be most effective there. 
I think he probably had some apprehension about it. So much respect, so much reverence for the presidency. Concern about whether a son of the South um, would be able to succeed and win that election. Um, those are feelings, not knowledge. Big difference in feelings and knowledge. But did I hear in the household, you know, come on, the same sort of fervor and commitment and drive and passion for the presidency and for running for that office and for winning that office? In 60, when he was running for the presidential spot, heavens no. The idea of leaving the Senate, the job that he was elected to do, to go campaign for another job, was an anathema to that. I mean, he understood the practical reality of needing to do it when we started having this primary stuff going on. But he said to me, he said, I don't know how I can go ask people to elect me to another job when I'm leaving the job they elected me to do in the first place. He said, I've got to make sure I get this one done right. So I think he didn't give it his first fruits of his efforts because he was given the Senate his first fruits. He loved the Senate. He understood the Senate. He was at home in the Senate. And that's one of the reasons why he was able to be as effective a president as he was, because he understood how to work with the Senate and the Congress so well. He knew how to push people's buttons. He knew what was important to them. He knew that he could say, look, you work with me on this one and I'll work with you on the other one. He had the rare understanding of all the cast of characters. And if he didn't know them, that was his homework for the moment. And by God, he got it done. He, he um, you know, people talk about him being a master of it. And yes, that's true. But he was in love with it. And, you know, most people think all he ever wanted was the president. See, well, the most people who think that were not the people who lived with him. Ah, what he wanted most was to serve the American people. Where was home? The Congress of the United States. And when he was catapulted into the presidency in a way that ripped out the heart of all Americans, and especially him, he stepped up to the plate, felt an exceeding weight of responsibility to the American people and to the 35th President of the United States, whom he'd served as Vice President, to try to finish the job that President Kennedy had marched on to the American stage. Um, In 64, could he have um, not run? Oh, yeah. Uh, health issues from the day he had his heart attack in 55 were always, I mean, Lyndon Johnson was always living each day as if it was his last. And that's one of the great lessons I had from him, was, you know, don't put it off to tomorrow. I mean, just make sure you just squeeze out of every day every opportunity for doing what you think is just and important. Because tomorrow may not be yours, and he realized that um, very very deeply. He realized that. But I don't think he was a man who, whose dream was to be President of the United States. Never thought it was his dream. I think his dream was to leave the world a better place than he found it. And he found the chance to do so much public good in the halls of Congress. When I was um, married for the first time, the U.S. Congress uh, um, gave me 
uh, a present. It was a Stuban bowl. And there was a little bit of controversy saying, you know, what on earth is a Congress? It's not a, a, a state wedding. What on earth is a Congress going out and, 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 and buying a present? It must be federal funds. must be federal funds to be buy a present for Lyndon Johnson's daughter. That's not right. Well, what the deal was that, you know, you go into any office in the country and uh, uh, somebody's child's getting married, the chances are that people at the office are going to want to pass the hat and say, you know, uh, Johnny's kid's getting married. Anybody want us to help buy a gift that we can give from the, from the company, from the office? Well, that was kind of what happened. <laughs> and there were people who wanted to and people who didn't. Uh, um, and, you know, the Congress was home. The White House was never home in the same way. But the chance to do the public good, ah, that was always there. So when he came back to Texas, a lot of people talk about my daddy. Um, in the later years of his life, uh, retreating to Texas, becoming a hermit, becoming a recluse. You know, people who all do that talk are all the people who weren't there. Uh, nobody knows better than you how much energy he poured into the book. Nobody knows better than you how much energy he poured, poured into building the library, uh, how much energy he poured into selling the uh, television station. And nobody knows more than all of you that he knew his energy was, was fleeting because his health was deteriorating. But by God, he was determined to squeeze every minute out of every day that he did. He discovered recreation. He thought this thing called vacation was something his staff members tried to do just irritating. We'd never really done that. And then he would go down on the, to Acapulco and take some friends down there, and, and uh, he loved it. He went to football games. I mean, he, he'd never done that. That was another thing people he, did him to irritate him. On Saturday afternoon, they wanted to go see football games when he had work to be done. Well, by God, you know, these were the last years of his life he saw, and, he, you know, he, he had the winningest coach in all of uh, uh, the United States living right here in Darrell Royal. And by God, he went to games and had Darrell Royal teach him all the lay of the land. He just, he loved life. Did he get down about some of the dreams that hadn't been filled? Yeah, sure, anyone would. But he adored life. I was really privileged uh, the day before my daddy died. I, I went out to the LBJ Ranch. And if I had known that he was going to die the next day, practically everything I could have wanted to do, somehow the Lord just blessed me. We just did. My father had given me a wonderful ring. And uh, he'd given the same ring to my sister and to my mother. And all of them had put theirs up and worn it kind of once a uh, uh, year for special occasions. I'd worn mine every day, and he said if I wanted to get it reset, I could. So I went to go get, get it in very plain setting to get it reset, and I, I made a mess of it. I destroyed it. I was, it was awful what I chose to do. So I was very downhearted and felt like I'd botched it, and so I put it in the safety deposit box. And it really made my daddy sad. He was a very sentimental man. How come you don't ever wear your ring? You used to wear your ring. You don't like your daddy's ring anymore kind of thing. Well, I got it reset. And the day before he died, I'd just gotten it back. And I put it on. And I put all the clothes on the kids that he'd given them for Christmas. And he went out and he was so proud of them. Took so much pleasure in the fact that I'd worn the ring that he'd given me. So much pleasure. And I dressed the children in his clothes. And we just sort of sat down and did a, you know, tell me about Daddy. I asked him, for example, about a picture of, of, uh, of Mr. Sam, Sam Reverend, that uh, hung in the living room. And I said, Daddy, was Mr. Sam like a, a father figure to you? And he said, oh, no, no, not like a father figure. That's too removed much more like a big brother, much more like a mentor, a big brother. And we had a conversation like that all day long. At the end of the day, he had a pilot, my father did, who was going on a trip to Oklahoma and hadn't been heard from. And Daddy began to worry. And Daddy was a, I mean, he was a first-time, big-time warrior, as you may remember, when he got something in, in, into his crawl. 
and he was terribly concerned. So he's on the phone, on the phone, on the phone, trying to find this pilot. Well, it came time for me to leave, and the children were cranky, and Mother said, go. So I blew Daddy a kiss goodbye, and he blew me a kiss goodbye, and I hugged Mother, and we walked out, and we got in the car, and we drove down from the foreman's house where we were all the way to the uh, graveyard, and we got to about the graveyard, and I looked at my ex-husband then, and my husband at the time, and I said to him, I said, Patrick, nobody says goodbye to my daddy for me, not even Mama. And he said, come on, Lucy, the kids are cranky. We've got to get home. I said, I know, I know, but please, just, just let me ask this one thing. I've got to go say goodbye to him myself. So he said, okay. So we turned around, we went back up, and Daddy was still on the phone, but by then he'd found the pilot. And he looked at me like, I thought you'd left. And I said, I'm here, and I sat down until he finally got off the phone. He said, what are you coming back for? I thought you'd already gone. And I said, Daddy, I just couldn't have other people saying goodbye to you for me. I just had to tell you that this day's meant more to me than any day I've ever had. And he said to me, Lucy, you know, it's meant more to me than any day I've ever had with you two. And we hugged each other. And I said, Daddy, I love you with all my heart. And he said, you're the best daddy a girl could have. And he said, and you're the best girl a daddy could have. That's the last time I talked to him. Earlier in the day, we talked, excuse me, we talked earlier in this interview about um, our, our family relations and any kind of resentment I might have had about how often he was or wasn't there. And earlier in the day, my father had said to me, um, Lucy, I want to ask you to forgive your daddy. And I said, forgive you for what, daddy? He said, forgive you for being gone so much. I said, daddy, there's nothing to forgive you for. And he said, no, 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 there's plenty to forgive me for, and I'm just asking you to forgive your daddy for not being a very good daddy. I said, Daddy, I'm not going to ask to forgive you for that because it's not so. You were there for every big occasion in my life. You always told me you didn't think you could get there, and then you always dropped out of heaven and showed up. And he said, yeah. But I wasn't there for any of the little ones. And I said, oh, Daddy, please don't do this to yourself. And he said, please don't do it to me. Just tell your father you forgive him. I said, I can't forgive you for what I don't hold against you. And he said, God, you're a stubborn kid. You hold this in your hand. You're the only one who can do it. Won't you forgive your daddy? So I held him in my arms and said, Daddy, I love you. You're the best daddy a girl could have. I forgive you. I needed that. Next. So some people have asked me, you know, did I know or did he know that he was going to be gone the next day? The answer is, I don't think either of us knew. I think Daddy was preparing from uh, July the 2nd, 1955, that his Lord could call him at any moment. And he just wanted to be, make sure that he'd done the most with the day he had in his hand. And that's what he'd done that day. But by gosh, what a gift to give your child. To have that kind of intimacy, that kind of love, that kind of humility, that kind of making them feel valued and important. Uh, that's one of my great dreams. That someday when the role is called up yonder over on the other shore for me, that I can look back and Maybe my children can feel like, hey, our mother made us feel that she really loved us and she really believed in us. And if we work just hard enough and care enough, no telling what good we could do. Cut. That's a great point. That was wonderful.